three, two, one, go. Hey everyone, my name is Monty Sheher, a modern classroom expert mentor and middle school science teacher in Atlanta, Georgia. Hi, and I'm Tony Rose Sheher, a modern classroom program manager and former middle school English teacher. And I am currently located in Lacey, Washington. And this is keeping up with the modern classrooms. So just a quick background. Um, if you've never worked with me and Monty before, I've never seen us before, we actually worked together in DC and implemented the MCP model in 2019-2020 uh, school year. So again, she taught middle school science at our school, and then I taught middle school English, and we never turn back. Yeah, so let's get us, let's go ahead and dive in. First of all, um, we want to make sure that we give a shout out to our member of the month for July, um, Mimi Laurent. We've noticed um, your thoughtful responses. We've noticed your engagement. We've noticed that you've been, you know, popping in, answering questions, um, noting your concerns and things like that. And we are here for it. If you're brand new to our Facebook group, we celebrate two members of the month. I mean, two members of the week, both get a sticker. Um, and then we choose a member of the month who also gets a free t-shirt. Um, and we choose these members not only because of their engagement, but we also look at, you know, they sometimes have thought provoking posts. Um, they share their resources. So we're super appreciative of everybody. And we just want everyone to keep contributing. Tony Rose, um, what's our topic of the month? Yeah, so um, our topic of the month for August is equity in mind. So Monty and I have noticed that there's been a lot of, you know, conversations and posts on Facebook, on Facebook about equity. So we decided, hey, you know what? Let's talk about it because it seems like everyone wants to talk about it, um, which is good. This is a conversation that we need to have. Um, and so we just wanted to just go ahead and have a conversation about what we've seen so far and how the model works to be able to create equitable classrooms. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen just so that hopefully everyone can see. Um, I'll present this real quick just so that everyone um, is on the same page. What does equity mean? And so for me, what Elena Aguilar actually came up with uh, for coaching for equity, this equity, this definition for equity actually like just resonated and stuck out with me. So essentially it just says education equity means that every child receives whatever they need to develop their full academic and social potential to thrive every single day. So by thrive, I mean academically as well as social, emotionally. Every child has a right to feel loved and cared for and to feel that they belong to a community. Emotional well-being is as important as academic success in this definition of educational equity. So that's a long drawn out definition and I know you've heard this if you've listened to the podcast before but I wanted to just reiterate this so that we're all on the same page education equity means that every child receives whatever they need to develop their full academic and social potential to, to thrive every day so it's not just the academic piece but it's also it's also the social emotional um, learning and then, of course, I wanted to show off the MCP uh, vision and values. And so I took off a, a phrase um, from the vision statement where it says every day in every classroom, every student will be appropriately challenged and supported. So it's not just like the 80% or the 85%, but it's literally every student will be appropriately challenged and supported with this model. And we have five different values. And I chose the two because it really spoke to me where it says every student deserves a responsive education. Again, focusing on every student and then as well as saying this movement belongs to all of us. So it's not just the students, it's not just families, it's not just admin, it's not just us as teachers, but it's actually all of us to make sure that our students are successful. Um, so one more thing that I wanted to share as well is, you know, welcome to the journey. This is an ongoing journey. Um, we are not perfect. Monty and I will probably say some things that will change later on, or we'll say some things that are like, oh, no, we didn't, you know, whatever it is, but just making sure that we'll make mistakes. We do not know it all. Um, and just like I said, this is an ongoing journey, right? Or we'll make mistakes, learn, unlearn, apologize, and reflect. And then, of course, we are always striving to be better and reflecting to ensure that we are showing up for our students the best way possible. So keeping in mind, again, equity work is hard work, but it is all worth it. And again, I'm so, so, so happy that everyone wants to talk about creating equitable classrooms um, just so that their students feel safe and respected and or rather just brave enough to be able to share their, um, their thoughts, right? So I'll stop sharing there. Um, the first thing that I really want to challenge people is that 
we want to check our, our biases, right? Monty and I were just talking about this, how every single day we kind of notice our biases towards a group of people. And now keeping in mind biases, that's a part of life. We have them. Um, it is what it is. Our job now is to actually disrupt those biases. So acknowledge the fact that like, oh, that's a bias that I have against this specific group that's different than me. And then disrupt that and then move forward with actionable steps to make it better. So again, with biases, it's natural that we all have biases. It's just now for us to be able to acknowledge it, take a step back, reflect, um, disrupt it, and then move forward, okay? So with that being said, right, we talk about how unit zero, you have the opportunity to establish a relationship with all of your students, and that's literally what we want to do. So um, I'm going to bring this back to Monty because I feel like I've been talking a while. Uh, so Monty, how do you start with self-reflection and awareness so that you'll be able to check your biases in your modern classroom? Um, so, um, so I do a lot at the beginning of the year, um, not only encourage and reflection within myself, but also within students. Um, and one of the things that I like to do every night for the first couple of weeks of school is I like to, you know, go in and not only like write down my own gratitude, but I also like to think about like what went well today, but like what are some areas where um, I could have improved upon? I really, especially in those first couple of weeks of school, I really listen to what the kids are saying. I give them not like, I don't want to use the word survey, but like I give them some sort of thing to fill out. And I go through and I read all of their responses later in the year. Am I as detailed oriented? Probably not. Um, I tend to glance over them, but in the beginning of the year, I'm really reading what they're saying. Are you liking what we're doing in class? Am I giving you everything that you need? Is where you're seated in the class, you know, working well for you. And part of the reason why I like to do that at the very beginning of the year is because as I'm getting to know them, um, it's super important for me to understand how they work, who they work well with, um, things like that. Um, and so I do that for like the first like three weeks of school. I try to do like a every other day type of survey type of thing, just asking them various questions about like some of the work that we've done, things like that. That's how I encourage self-reflection within myself. And then I change things as needed. If a kid was like, that thing you said to me like was not good or you've been actually mispronouncing my name. Some kids don't tell you. Um, I mispronounce a kid. I, rem I will never forget. I mispronounce a kid's name wrong for the first four months of school. He never once corrected me. Just based on the spelling, that's how I thought it was said. He never said anything after that first day. So I just kept saying it until one day a kid was like, you know, his name is actually pronounced this way. And of course I was like, why didn't you tell me? And he was just like, oh, I don't know. And as somebody with a very unique name, my full name, if you, you know, in Facebook, you don't see this, but my name is Montanique. And I grew up with my name being mispronounced. And you get to a point where, yeah, you do stop correcting people. Um, because it's one of those things of like, by the time you reach upper middle school, early high school, you forget. And so I'll never just forget saying this kid's name wrong. And so now I ask them, is there anything that I've done that like has not sat well with you? And I ask them this um, and I reflect. I also do the same thing with them, just asking them to also like reflect on their own experiences. Like, did you put in as much effort as you could have? Um, you know, did you do things as well as you could have? Just really also encouraging that self-reflection within them. This year I'm um, starting what's called dialogue journals. I don't know if you have any, any experience with those, Tony Rose. Um, um, I love but, them, Monty. Okay, well, great. We'll definitely have to talk offline about this, but I'm starting dialogue journals this year as another way just to not only be reflective of myself, but also have students also be reflective. Um, and I read about this on Code of Pedagogy. So if you're a fan of Code of Pedagogy, it's where I got this idea from, and I've done a lot of research, and I'm really excited to incorporate this aspect into my class as a way to kind of bridge some communication between me and the students and really break down those walls, because I want kids to see me as a partner in their education and not just like this person that like sits at the top like I want them to see me as you know someone that's beside them where we can have these authentic conversations together yeah I mean you you basically said a whole bunch of things right um Monty, Sorry. So with self-reflection no, no 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 it's great I just wanted to summarize right with self-reflection we in this model it's, it's so nice to be able to have the students reflect on their learning um and we want to encourage you to also reflect on your teaching right so what all those questions that Monty asks her students, Monty probably asks herself as well. And you could do this even at the end of the unit. I do, um, I write every single night, um, but it's just a great way for me to be able to write down my thoughts and really think about like, again, what, what Monty was saying, what went well today, some celebrations, and then what can I improve later on? Um, especially when working with students, right? Like 
for you to be able to uh, gain their trust, to be able for them to trust you, you have to authentically show up as yourself. Um, Cause students will definitely know if you are being um, fake with them, if you're not, you know, being honest with them. And so with that, like, this is why it's really important to really be self-aware of your thoughts, your actions, um, everything you do as a teacher and as just a human being, because you'll have students. Now, Monty is like, hey, you know, I welcome all critique and feedback. And sometimes our students say it in a really blunt way. Um, and it's like, it's really interesting, right? Working with middle school, like you gotta have a thick skin because they'll tell you straight up like, oh, you have a pimple on your forehead. Well, Misty, look at that big pimple on your forehead and continue to, you know, go and remind you of all of your like, um faults right um and even with students they're really good with like giving us like feedback on our blind spots and i think i've shared this before with one of my students you know we were talking about um we were talking about code talkers and we we're talking about um the navajo uh, soldiers and then we like connected it with trans soldiers and then it was really interesting my students were like misty we haven't talked about any latinx like soldiers at all can we like talk about that and so we had and it was like a way for me to step back and be like oh my gosh i thought that i had my bases covered when really i haven't um, and so it was really good that my students were able to kind of, they were brave enough to just say, hey, Misty, here's a blind spot for you. Um, this is something that's missing in the curriculum. Can you like make some changes and make it happen? And then I do. Um, and so again, just being open with them, um, asking for, you know, feedback. Feedback is really harsh, right? Like, but at the same time, it's like, what will make your teaching better? Um, because it's not just you, you're not the gatekeeper of the knowledge, just like what Monty was saying, like, you know, just, she wants to be partners with them. We're all thought partners and not necessarily like, I'm the teacher, I'm the adults, you have to listen to me all of the time. And this is something that I tell my kids too all the time. It's like, actually, I don't know that answer. Can you find out for me and then let me know and let the class know? So then it's kind of like, oh, Miss D is not the know it be all person in this class. Like I could actually teach her and I could teach the class as well. And that creates an even better environment for students. Um, so, We'll dive right into the um, the comments and the questions in the Facebook group. And then of course, like Monty and I will share all of the resources as well as we talk about um, all of these things that we're gonna talk about. So uh, Monty, do you wanna read the first one? Yeah, so yeah, the so first question that we're covering is, what is classroom management? What is your classroom management plan in specific steps? And how does it align with equity, love, healing, student-centered regulation and call students in rather than calling them out and punishing them? Um, I love this question because I think it's super important. And even thinking back to my own schooling, this took a while, I feel like, to feel included. One of the things that I like to do is right off the bat, I try to make sure every kid is involved, every kid has a voice, every kid knows that you know, they are loved and that they belong in the classroom. And part of the way I do this is I was fortunate, you know, to spend the first three years of my teaching career at like a school that practiced like use restorative practices. Um, and naturally when I left that school and kind of transitioned into like public school, I carried a lot of those practices with me. So one of the things that I do at the start of every school year is I make a relationship agreement with all of my classes um, where we kind of really look at, you know, what, how do we want to be treated in the past? Like, I feel like it was very heavily focused on respect, you know, because again, we all want to be respected, but I feel like this year, especially as I transition into kind of like a new school, one of the things that they've really focused on this year is, you know, instead of asking us, like, we all know we want to be respected, but really asking students and asking yourself as the educator, how do you actually want to be treated, you know, deeper than the respect piece, how do we want to be treated? And asking myself that, and I plan to ask the kids that in a few days, I feel like it allows for us all to be on the same page. We write this agreement together, everybody signs the agreement, we hang it up, you know, we refer to it. This year, I'm even gonna type it up and print it out and have it, put them as the, have it as the first page of their binder. And anytime anybody does anything, including myself, we're gonna call each other out like, hey, we agreed as a team that we're gonna value each other's time. Right now, we're not valuing each other's time. We agreed that we would talk to each other at appropriate levels, like our voices are elevated and we're not respecting the agreement. Um, and that's how I've like done it. And I just love starting my year out that way. Yeah, and um, it's also just good to keep in mind too, that like 
you want to have clear expectations, right? Like you want to have clear routines and procedures. That thing will never go away. You need to have clear expectations, clear guidelines um, for students. Um, and you can create that as a community together um, so that you all can be a part of that decision process. So with me, I have flexible seating. Um, and a lot of teachers really kind of cringe at the thought of flexible seating. Um, and the way that I rolled this out with students is that, you know what, I trust you to make the right decisions. So if I trust you to make the right decisions and you're not doing something that you're supposed to be doing, I now have the right to move you. And so students understand like, okay, Ms. D trusts us to make whatever decision we need to, to, we need to make for her classes. And if there's something that's inappropriate or distracting, Ms. D has the right to like, take it away from us, right? And that's the agreement that we came up with. And students really actually like that as opposed to me trying to hone in on like controlling where they sit, controlling what they do, all of that stuff. They know that I trust them. And so they know like, okay, I'm not gonna mess up because I don't wanna ruin this trust with Misty. Um, and so like, and that's another thing too, like I have flexible seating, but then I know if a class is like all the way turned up, I'm like, you know what? Flexible seating is not working right now. Tomorrow you're going to have assigned seats. And and when you can show me that you're able to get back flexible seating, then we can go back to flexible seating. Um, it's something, you know, and they understand that as well. So they complain, they groan, whatever it is, but they know for a fact, like, yeah, we've been turned up, like we get it, Miss D, and we'll try and earn that back. Um, and then as far as like calling out rather than calling in, right? Um, once you create that relationship with your students, it's now holding each other accountable, accountable, right? So it's no longer calling them out, right? It's, it's more like, no, you're gonna hold me accountable. I'm gonna hold you accountable because we have the same respect and agreement for our space, for our learning space. And so I think like a lot of the times, um, I have a look, a teacher look. I think everyone has a teacher look. Um, but for me, I don't have to say anything. My students know that if I look at them a certain way, like something's up. <laughs> um, but I will actually never yell at a student nor yell at a class because again, that just like creates a harmful environment and not necessarily something that'll be um, useful, right? So when Monty talks about restorative practices, definitely look into that. Um, however, there are some people who are not doing restorative just practices correctly. So definitely do some research on that before you dive right into it. Um, but definitely, you know, if a student is having um, some struggles, some challenges, like pulling them to the side, having the conversation one on one, or if they're just having a moment, just letting them know, be like, you know what, the model gives us time and space for you to go take a five minute break right now. Like you're not feeling great. So why don't you go take a five minute break and then come back when you're feeling well, um, or you're feeling better when you have your feelings um, all together, right? And you're not just like lashing out just because you want to lash out. Um, and the thing with this too, um, I do, I know Monty does as well, like a daily do now um, where students kind of check in with how they're feeling. And so with that form, when students turn it in, like it goes into a Google sheet and then it kind of highlights who's having a bad day. So you can quickly catch it. And another thing that you could do is like, greet your students at the door, right? Um, and so you can kind of gauge like who's having a good day and who's having a bad day. So with the model, they're able to just pick up where they um, left off. And then you can go and check in with those students to make sure that what the, to make sure that they're okay, first of all, right? Because if our students aren't feeling great, they're not gonna learn anything that day. And so just a quick five minute check-in with that student will definitely be impactful. Um, and so there's a lot, I mean, you know, people could go all day about classroom management. Um, definitely ask your students, make sure that your students are part of the decision process, make sure that, you know, they're clear routines and procedures in the classroom, um, the expectations agreements are um, decided together, whatever that may look like for you, right? Um, you don't want to be yelling at students, you want to keep like a um, not a monotone, um, but Monty, do you remember like one of our English teachers, he was really good with keeping his emotions in place. What did, what was that word? Called? Anyways, like just be neutral, be neutral because students will try you all day long. Um, okay, we're going to move on to grading. We've had a couple of questions about grading. This one specifically, it says, I'm wondering if anyone is using a true mastery grading approach where only assessments count towards the final grade and those can be redone as needed. Um, what was your approach on that, Monty? 
Yeah, I want to start by prefacing and saying grading is like super important and we get a lot of questions about grading and we are going to do a longer session on grading so just know that that's coming eventually we will talk a lot more about grading. Um, but I think the biggest thing with grading that's like hard for people to wrap their mind around is like we're all in different settings. And some of us are in settings where our school says we're mastery based or but in a lot of us are in traditional settings where we grade XYZ. As always, my greatest piece of advice is go with what you think is best, because again, you're the expert in your room. In terms of the actual question itself, like if we're grading for true equity with the one assessment thing, um, there's a lot of pros and cons to that. And I think you also have a lot of people who argue for it, argue against it. Um, my personal views are that kids should get assessed on what truly assesses what they know. Um, nothing else really theoretically should go in the grade book. But again, I know that everyone's not set up that way. So if you are in a situation where you're told, oh, I need to put in a grade a week or I have to grade classwork, do that, do that. Because again, that's what you are being told to do. Um, and I, at this point in time, I think where we are in the United States of America, I don't think there's a clear cut answer to this question without sounding just me telling my personal views about it, because um, I don't think that's helpful necessarily. I think depending on where you are, your it dic what, how you grade dict is dictated by where you are. And that's just really what it is, if I'm being completely honest. Yeah, and that's really unfortunate. Um, and again, you know, working at our school, we had, I was able to tell my students, don't ask me about grades, like grades aren't important. Um, what I want you to focus on is your growth and the feedback that you're receiving to show that growth. Um, so if you're going to come at me and say, Ms. D, what did I get? I'm not going to answer that. I'm actually going to ignore it um, because I want you to look at the pacing tracker and be able to figure out where you are um, as far as your skills, as far as your concepts. But, um, and this was a huge shift for my students, right? And so uh, it was it, it just turned out really well and nice because I just, you know, I had that um, ability to not focus on grades. Um, but again, like what Monty says, you know, do what you got to do for the school district for whatever your school is asking. There is no right or wrong way to do this, um, in my opinion. Assessment should be the only things that are being graded uh, because the classwork is really practice for them to be able to do the summative and formative assessment. So that's just my personal opinion. We could keep going back and forth with that, uh, but thank you for asking that question. Um, okay, so we have another one where basically, essentially, this teacher um, was saying that self-pacing is great but it just ends up that he's working with the same students every single time um so it's kind of like why haven't the same 10 students gained the skills to not fall behind each unit all year i'm thinking maybe i'm not making enough accommodations or limitations of distance learning might be contributing so there's a lot of factors as well um but how do you deal with how do you manage that mati if it's like the same students every single time does that happen to you um yes they are they are definitely some of the same students that um traditionally need to work like closer with me and i think that as educators like we see these kids sometimes and we think like oh my gosh they're a damsel in distress we need to like hop in and like save them um and so you know in like a traditional class like oh is it a bad thing that this kid works slower and like needs more support no it's not and there's nothing wrong with it. if you're working with the same five kids more closely every single day it's because those five kids need you every single day and that's completely okay some kids don't necessarily need you as much and that's okay what i like to do especially when i was at dci i did have a small pocket in my fourth period class especially who just needed way more support i think you know they they were, you know, students who just, they needed me and they, they needed me to tell them like what to do and when to do it. And I was okay putting them in a small group, you know, two to three times a week and working with them. Um, but I also made it a point to make sure that, you know, I kind of just had like a check checkboard, not checkboard, clipboard that I walked around with and, you know, it had all of their names and I would just put a check mark every time I talk to a particular student outside of the group because I'm like spending more time with this like small group I did want to also make sure that like other kids aren't feeling neglected some kids like they could never talk to you and they're like fine and the relationship's fine and like they'll come talk to you when they need you and they'll tell you their entire life story but like they really don't need to talk to you every day and they're like fine with that and then you have other kids who like who are in the small group who crave that attention but I also made it a point to make sure that like I circulated um every day and I tried to talk say one have one small personal conversation with like Obviously, I was not doing this every day with every kid, but like five to six kids every day say, OK, on this day, I talked with like little Johnny and we had a conversation about X, Y, Z, um, just to make sure that I was touching point with everybody. But I think it's 
I think it's okay if like you're consistently working with some of the same kids because these are sometimes your kids who you know, head down, not doing any work, not taking any notes. Um, and so if they're working more closely with me and like they're doing things and they're taking notes and they're doing the practice, I would rather that over my traditional class where I didn't even know this kid didn't take notes. And then two weeks later, we're taking a quiz and they're like, oh, I ain't took no notes, Miss Wooder. I'm like, what? Like we did two weeks worth of notes. Um, so that that's just really my take on it. Yeah, and you can also do gradual release. So I had specifically like two students who just needed handholding, right? And because they've just gone through schooling with someone holding their hand. So they're not used to doing, to being independent learners. And so what I would do is that, yes, I'm going to spend time with you when you need it. However, I'm going to need for you to do that work as well. So how about you do this for about seven minutes and I'll come back to you in seven minutes and then we'll have a discussion about what you did in that seven minutes. Now, there may be times where seven minutes is too long so you would say four minutes but just like gradually releasing like them depending on you right like gradual release of like oh missy i need you i need you i need you actually don't like all the directions are there for you all of the resources are there for you um you just need me to cheer you on so i'm going to cheer for you and i know that you're going to do this and i like i know that you got this and i completely um yeah, I, I, we can completely like um, do this together, but I know that you're able to do this on your own. So of course you're gonna have some pushback, but then like, you know, start off with four minutes, you do this, give them specific directions of what they need to do, check back with them in four minutes. And then next time you'd be like, okay, in six minutes, I want you to do this and then check back with them. So then, you know, their confidence gets higher because sometimes their students, when they ask for a lot of help, it's because their confidence is really low and they just don't want to fail. And they think that if you're with them, sitting with them, you won't see them as a failure. It's just more so like, Oh, but Miss D's assisting me. So then I don't have to make all of these mistakes on my own. Um, and so it's definitely a shift. Um, so just keeping that in mind. Um, and then, so we have about like eight minutes left. Um, we also just wanted to point out that there has been some comments about um, equitable practices with modern classroom model. And something that Monty and I have been pushing for is that please, do the free course first so that you can have a better understanding of what our model essentially looks like, right? I know like looking away from it, you're like, oh, but how is this equitable for students? Um, and so I would really, really encourage you to take the free course first, and then we'll continue to have those conversations because in the free course, you'll have resources, you have research backed strategies as well, and like why the model works and why it's equitable. And so definitely take a look at the free course so that we can continue having those conversations um, with like the proper context, right? Um, one thing that Monty and I really wanted to share as well, we like there, there were so many likes for this one. And I know I definitely chuckled when I saw it. Um, and so it is, let me see. It's this one right here by Scott, so we don't want to steal it, um, but it is by Scott, and I know I definitely chuckled when I saw this, um, and so it's like, okay, Scott gets his kids, first of all, um, he's using some terms that will definitely get kids either rolling their eyes, laughing, or something, but essentially they understand what this rubric stands for, right? Um, Monty, do you have any thoughts on this? You're muted, girl. <laughs> Just kidding. Here I am. Um, I love when I saw this because I've done something similar in that typically at the end of like notes or anything like that, I'll have them rate themselves on kind of like a one to four scale of like what you're understanding. But what I liked about this is because, yeah, it, it adds in some of that like lingo and like or or who knows if they say bruh anymore. Like they're always like, Miss Water, you're like so out of touch with what's real. And I'm like, oh, y'all don't say lit anymore or like fleek or period. No. OK. Um, but I liked it because I feel like they put it in a really student friendly language um, and it, it allows for you to really see where they are. Um, and kids are normally I know sometimes teachers are like, do I trust them? Like kids are actually very reflective. They'll tell you like, I'm a three, I'm a two, I'm a one. I ain't did nothing. They'll tell you, they really will. So I think using something similar to this, even if like you don't use the, the lingo in the middle there, um, I think using something similar is like really cool. Um, and I normally put, I normally put something similar at the end of my notes. Like after they've done notes and they watched the Ed puzzle, I normally have them write the number um, just so I know like who I need to check in with more. Prioritize your time, things like that. 
Yeah, and I think this is actually a really great segue to our next thing. Um, I love the fact that there's actually no, um, like it doesn't say mastered, right? It literally says goat. I know it well enough to teach it to my my peers, which is something that I tell my students all the time. Hey, if you truly understand a concept, a skill, a topic, then that means you can get other people to understand it. So um, I love the fact that a four is a goat. Um, if you don't know what goat stands for, it's greatest of all time. Um, and so it just says, I know it well enough to teach it to my peers and I love it. And this is just such a great example because it's also in Spanish. So it's just accessible for all students. Um, another thing too, so we were talking about um, so we were talking about the word mastery. There's been a couple of posts about the word mastery on the Facebook um, group. And so one thing that we want to let you know is that you can actually use other words. You don't actually have to use mastery based grading. So we can start shifting that language if you want. You have that choice. Um, a couple of alternative words that we came up with, we meaning members of the Facebook group, because it's definitely not me, um, but I really like it. Uh, one of them is skill achievement which I was like, oh, that's really cool. Um, Monty calls hers learning checks. One of my um, one of my mentees call it a progress check. Um, you can say a growth check even, right? There's concept achievement. Um, and if you really want a fancy word, you could go with proficiency, competency, and, standard, and standards based, um, which of course, like some historical context of that, you can Google it. But again, you can like, play around with these words. You don't, you, are, you don't have to be married to the word mastery um, or mastered or anything like that. You can definitely create and come up with different alternative words for it, just so that we are, again, providing that brave space for students. Um, and there's also um, just, we can continue having that conversation as well in the Facebook group. Um, a couple of things that you're going to find, I'm going to share my screen again, just so that you can see all the resources that we're going to share with you. Um, this is the accessibility guide that actually came out recently um, from Modern Classrooms. And so it just basically tells you how you can make your resources a little bit more or just more accessible for all students and not just for some. So there's lots of links here. There's checklists that you can take a look at um, and you can make a copy of this and check it out. The SEL do now that I was telling you about my favorite part was what is bringing you joy right now it's really good for students to start focusing on what brings them joy things to celebrate because you know the world with what's happening, it can be really depressing and then especially like we don't know what's going on at home so getting them to focus in on like what is bringing you joy right now um, is really good to ask in the beginning of your classroom every single or in the beginning of your class so every single day my students filled this out. Um, another thing that you're going to get is just the gender inclusivity and so um, and you have your asset based language so these these two resources that you'll get is just basically shifting our language usage and so we know English evolves English is so hard to learn it's not even my native language and so I struggle with it a lot um, but our words are always evolving, right? So to create um, inclusive spaces and brave spaces, we have um, given you some guidelines on what you can start using and what you can start getting rid of um, as far as words are concerned, right? So again, just keeping in mind, you wanna check your biases, you need to be self-aware, you need to self-reflect, um, you need to start changing your language. These are you know, steps to create an equitable classroom. The asset based language is basically showing like what's problematic words that we used before and then what are some preferred terms now and again those things will continue to evolve. Um, and the last thing that I really wanted to point out that's been getting a lot of hype is that I have this padlet that I've just been constantly collecting different DI resources and so if you're really into books or podcasts articles movies, shows videos resources for white folks other resources and then even organizations and people to follow social media if you have more um you can definitely add on there as well i've allowed it you know I've, i have the padlet to where you can add in more if there's something that that we're missing which i'm sure i'm missing a lot because there's a lot of different resources happening right now but this is just a good go-to for me in case i'm looking for something right um so these are just a couple of resources that we're sharing with you and so monty let's wrap it up
Yeah. So as always, Tony Rose and I are super appreciative of everybody. Um, we're super excited to be doing this. Um, remember, a week after our show is published, we will host a Twitter chat to talk about um, whatever our topic of the month is, this time equity. So join us at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time next week if you have more questions, um, want more resources, you want to widen your network, etc. And if you don't know what a Twitter chat is, you're in a brave space because this will be our second Twitter chat. Um, so we're going to we're going to just learn together. Follow modern at modern classrooms Proj on Twitter um, to be able to follow along with that Twitter chat. And that's all we have for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Yeah. And you know what? We got to close it out with Miss Frizzle from the Magic School Bus, because why not? It shows our age. So take chances, make mistakes and get messy. See you all next month. Thank you.